My name is David Summerfleck. For over 20 years, I worked as a digital marketing agency project manager and consultant where I helped business owners go from failure and ruin to reinvesting profits. Now I'm interviewing other experts and professionals to find out what makes them tick and get their thoughts on how you can learn from their experiences and revitalize your life professionally and personally. We cover topics as wide ranging as digital marketing, business innovation, culture, global trends, and ways we can all better channel our creativity. So let's join the discussion. Hello, and welcome to another episode of the David Summerfleck podcast. I'm your host, David Summerfleck. Today, my guest is Genesis Amaris Kemp. Am I saying that correctly? Yes. Thank you. Genesis is a creative content writer, author, self-development advocate, visionary inclusion and diversity enthusiast, and a force to be reckoned with. Genesis is a woman of color who has said enough is enough and is now bolder than ever. She has tried to remain quiet, but it didn't work out so well. So, because change did not occur. Today, she is readapting to the current times and making some life-changing decisions, stepping outside of her comfort zone by speaking up, challenging the status quo, and refusing to let limitations placed on her keep her down. That's very good. Genesis sees herself as a visionary and a woman who will go on to do great things, and empower others to speak up for themselves. Genesis, thank you for joining me on the podcast today. I hope you're doing well. Um, can we start off with a little bit more introductions as far as who you are, what you do, how you got started in the corporate world, and how you eventually came to write your book? Yes. So first and foremost, David, thank you so much for allowing me to be on your platform. And how I really got introduced to the corporate setting was back in high school, I did a co-op program where my first job was in real estate. I was a personal assistant for Remax Preferred Homes. Then I went on to work at the Cancer Center, which I absolutely love that job because I always wanted to do something in the medical field. However, my time there at the Cancer Center was cut short due to another uh, five-star facility that opened up and poached our cancer patients because they had more research, more technology, and et cetera, and they couldn't afford to keep me on the payroll since you know they were losing clients. So then I was like, oh, snap, what am I going to do? I'm still in this co-op program. So I did what any person would do, and that was to really think on my toes and pivot. So I went to my professor, uh, well, not professor, I went to my teacher because it's high school, and I told her what happened, and she's like, okay, let's see what we can find. And then she stumbled across a small, smaller oil and gas company. I'm like, oh, I really don't want to do oil and gas. I was trying to do this to get my feet in the door for the medical industry because I always wanted to be a pediatrician ever since I was a little girl, but I guess God had other plans. He's like, <laughs> so I entered into the company. It was a corrosion company, a smaller mom and pop company, British, uh, British owned. And I ended up working my way up in that company and stayed there for four and a half years. And then once I got all the way up, you know, the corporate ladder at that particular company, I wanted to really advance my career. So then I started applying for other um, Fortune 500 companies that were still in the oil and gas sector because I was like, okay, now I have four and a half years of experience. I want to do something more. And that's where I land a job at a particular Fortune 500 company here in Texas. And then I stayed there for seven and a half years up until recently. 
when the whole pandemic happened last year, I found out that I was going to be laid off one week after my father had passed away, which it was bittersweet because mm. I had wanted to do something else. But then I guess it was a way of God closing the door to letting me know there's more in store for you because there was things that I wanted to do that, you know, I was kind of just settling because I was doing a nine to five job where I'm building someone else's brand and empire instead of building my own legacy and doing things that truly matter to me, which is diversity, equity and inclusion, really consulting where I help people, you know, look at their business. What are what are some of your dreams and goals? And how do you plan to articulate that into business? What is your business plan? Do you have a SWOT analysis? Like, are you are you afraid to take the leap because you're afraid of the unknowns? And so now, just doing that, then um, my work experiences working for that Fortune 500 company led me to writing the book because I saw a lot of systemic racism personally as well as professionally. I also was underpaid for seven and a half years while working for that company up until last year whenever the whole Black Lives Matter movement happened and I spoke out in a meeting with the vice president. They gave me a 20% pay increase one week after I spoke up. Now, and whoa, 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 whoa. <laughs> Wait a minute now. You're getting to the juicy details now. As far okay, as far as the SWOT analysis and business plan, that's a whole separate thing. I can talk to you after the podcast about that because that's my forte. So we'll, maybe we can talk about that afterwards. What was your did you have a position title so we have like a frame of reference and then what did you say in the meeting oh, yeah. that got their attention? So when I first started with that particular Fortune 500 company, I started as an administrative assistant. Okay. Then I was going to school at night to get my bachelor's degree. I was going to school for psychology because remember, I wanted to go into the medical field. So I wanted to use psychology as a stepping stone. Then they told me, what do you plan on doing with a psychology degree at this oil and gas company? You're not going to go far. So we strongly suggest you change your degree. So I ended up changing my degree because they sweetened the pot yeah. because and they offered to pay for my tuition, which okay. I was working to try to put myself through college. And of course, with the help of my older brothers here and there, they were footing, helping me foot the bill too, which I'm grateful for. So then I ended up changing my degree from psychology to supply chain and logistics in technology with double minors, one in purchasing and one in organizational leadership and supervision. And once I finally got my degree in December of 2016, after working full time and going to school at night, plus being engaged around the certain time, so I had a lot going on. Um, I was like, okay, I'm ready for a professional role. It was another hoop I had to jump through. Then I finally got my first professional role as a raw material coordinator for polypropylene. Polypropylene is a form of plastics. And then I had to go work in the chemical plant, which I knew nothing about working in a chemical plant. I'm like this prim, prissy girl or whatnot. And I'm like, you're sending me where? In a chemical plant? With... FRCs, flame retardant clothing and all this. Yeah. Um, so then I was like, you know what, God, I'm going to roll with it because it's a stepping stone and it's going to, you know, complement my degree. So I took that assignment around that time I had got engaged to my husband now and it was hard because he planned everything for the wedding up until, you know, my hair, makeup and dress. So I was like, uh, this is affecting my work and home life balance. I like, I don't want him to leave me because I haven't planned anything for the wedding really. And so I stayed in that role for 11 months. And then I just got ballsy one day and I told my supervisor, I said, Hey, I need to do something else. Um, that will allow me to have work workplace flexibility, work in home where I'm meeting my metrics, but I'm also getting home at a reasonable time where I could spend time with my family. So mm. then they're like, well, there's not really anything or whatnot. And I said, well, I may just have to look outside the company then because I'm not willing to sacrifice this time that I'm not going to get back. So then finally, before I get ready to take my Christmas vacation, they come to me and they're like, great news. We think we found something for you. But, and you know, there's always a but. 
So they're like, but you have to interview for it. And I'm like, seriously, I already work for this company. Why do I need to interview for this job? Why can't it just be a job transfer similar to my counterparts who are male and female who identify as Caucasian? They easily move just like that. But now you're mm. telling me I have to interview. So I interviewed for it. Didn't think much of it. And I was like, okay, then I'm on my vacation. Then I get a call that says, hey, we just want to let you know that, you know, you got the position. You're going to be starting um, this day and it's going to be in trade regulations doing compliance. Another stretch activity, because I knew nothing about trade regulations and I knew nothing about compliance. But I said, you know what, God? Um, I'm going to just leave it in your hands. I'm going to go in there with a good attitude. I'm going to learn what I need to learn. And it was the first time that the company ever created a role like that. So I did not have any backup material to fall back on. I had to make the role what it was and et cetera. So I said, you know what? I'm just going to go in there and I'm going to own it like a boss because this is going to be my little baby that I'm going to really birth. <laughs> and I did that and it it was not easy. It was hard. And plus, I was also the youngest person on my team, but then also the only African-American person on my team. So I could also see that they were treating me differently and it was a constant challenge. And then there was one meeting that really broke the tip of the iceberg. And that was when I saw the classification levels of my peers. At that time, I was a CL 15 and my peers were starting at a CL 22. So at this particular, in this particular role, I was traveling for the company, representing the company to three global distributors, one freight forwarder. I had a company Amex card, I got, Emerald Isle status where mm -hmm. I can all the perks, but yet you still see me as an administrative assistant and you're paying me as an administrative assistant. And you can see the difference between a CL 15 and a CL 22. That is a, that's a big jump right there. So I'm like, I'm underpaid by X amount and I'm doing the work of a professional, something is not right there. So whenever it came time for that meeting after the whole George Floyd incident, where he called us all together, those of us that identified as black or African American, then, you know, I was kind of just sitting back and just seeing what other people were going to say. Then he called on me and he's like, what's your personal stance with racism and your professional stance? And that's where I was like, okay, you know, the ball is in my court. I have no strings attached. And at this point, I'm already mentally checked out because of all the things that has been happening behind the scenes for the various years. So I said, well, personally, I said, it's a problem whenever you're going to the grocery store and I'm with my niece and nephew who are half Caucasian and a older white woman stops me and asks me, Whose kids are those? Are you responsible for those kids? And what what do you say? What do you do in that instance, especially when we're when we're in times where people call the cops on people for no apparent reason or whatnot because they assume the worst versus assuming something else? And I said that affects that affects me personally. And I said another time is my husband and I were driving to Dallas, Texas. We get pulled over by a state trooper. When the state trooper realizes that I work for this particular oil and gas company and that my husband's a chef at a well-known um, facility, then he says, oh, okay, I'm going to let you go with a warning. And I said, that affects you personally. Absolutely. Let me ask you, didn't it feel... Well, I don't want to put a word, put words in your mouth. How did it feel that a boss or supervisor was asking you to articulate your feelings about racism in general or the George Floyd uh, case in general? At first, it felt like they were doing it to check the box because our company was 
one of the last companies to really come out and have our CEO make a statement after the George Floyd incident. And it was like we as minorities and people in the black the black ERG group, employee resource group, we had to tell management that our CEO should make a statement because if a statement is not made, this is how we as minorities feel working for this particular company. We feel like we're just a number. We feel like we're just a token. We feel like we don't matter. And I said, so I felt like by them having Mm -hmm. that discussion and bringing us in the room for those of us that identify as African-American, Black, or Brown. And I really need to stop saying black because the color of my skin is brown. The hair, my hair color is black. And Jane Elliott taught me that in a recent um, video I watched. That's right. And you're not black. This microphone, the top of this microphone is black. Maybe your hair is black, but your skin is not. It's, it's a, it's an expression. You have more melanin than I do, but your skin is actually a, a, a more light brown actually. So I think it's really important to draw those distinctions. A Caucasian person isn't white. A Caucasian person is maybe pink or shades of of that. But I think it's important. <laughs> right, which is nice. Um, but it, I think it's important that people make these distinctions rather than look at human beings as objects that we need to find some way to put into a round hole or a square hole some for some reason. Am, am I on the wrong track or the right track? No, you're on the right track. And I like the way that you broke it down because when I heard Jane Elliott break it down that way, I said, she's absolutely correct. Like we are, we're not black, just like white people are not white. We just have different shades of the color. She's like, and she, the way she broke it down, she said, the color of your teeth are white. The color of my shirt is white. My skin is not white. Right. And she's, and then she says, and if you look at me, I'm speckled. I have, you know, these spots in my face, speckles. And the way she just articulated and really broke it down, I was like, wow, this is so true and so real and transparent. I think more people need to listen to Jane Elliott, but some people don't want to hear the truth or they want to tiptoe around the subject matter. But back to <laughs> to the story a little bit, and um so then I, I gave those two examples. Then it was time for me to give my professional example. And I said, well, it bothers me that I started in this company at 2013 as an administrative assistant. Then I went on to be a raw material coordinator. Yes, you bumped up my pay, but you bumped it up by $1,000 due to my commute. Then I go on to be a compliance coordinator for exports where I manage the relationship of three global distributors, one freight forwarder. I represent the the company to C-suite executives and et cetera. Then you bump my pay up a little bit, but it's nowhere in comparison to what you are paying new college graduates who are just now coming into this company with no work experience in comparison to me. Then in comparison to my peers who are on my team, you're telling me that I will not be able to compete professionally, but yet I am doing the work of a professional. And what administrative assistant in the company travels Mm. on the company dime? What administrative assistant has an Amex card, which is a company American Express card? Administrative assistants normally have a P card, a procurement card. What administrative assistant is allowed to use the company Um, the company car service where they come to your house and pick you up and drive you to the airport and drop you off if you choose not to drive yourself. Where do you get the Emerald status? You have all these perks of a professional, but yet you're paying me as an administrative assistant. Do I not have the four degree from a tier one university such as the University of Houston? Did I not have previous oil and gas experience coming into this company? Do I not have the knowledge, the insight, and the tenure for working for this company for seven and a half years? And I said, 
it that bothers me and it makes me feel like as if I don't matter. But I said, the reason why I stayed here as long as I did is because I have to keep a roof over my head, keep food on the table. And my husband and I are a team. And at this point of my life, I have to work in order to make ends meet. And what was his reaction? And he was kind of shocked. And he said, well, thank you so much for sharing. We're definitely going to look into this. And I think the icing on the top was that there was a HR representative in the room and there were two black individuals, well, no, there was two brown individuals in the group that identified as managers and there were two brown individuals that identified as supervisors out of a group of 30 people or less who were identified as colored in a global supply chain organization. Think about that for a minute. A global supply organization, less than 30 of us who identified as brown, identified as minorities, identified as African-American people, less than 30. Yeah. And only a total of four were in a management position. Two being a, a two of them being managers and two being supervisors. The rest were individual contributors. Why is that? Well, we know why. So my questions are, during this time, how did you cope? Because you may have enjoyed the work that you were doing, but, and, and, and I obviously that's something for you to answer. Did you enjoy the work that you were doing? But also, how did you cope during that time feeling that you're not being noticed, not being paid commensurate to your experience? So in the beginning, when I started the role, it was something new. It was fun. It was exciting. I did enjoy it in the beginning. But then as time went on and I started to see how my peers were being treated in comparison to me. When I saw the metrics that one day in the meeting, that was just confirmation of, man, I'm just a, I'm just a number to them. Then it started to make me feel less than. But then how did I cope? My faith in God helped me cope. At the time, my parents, my dad was very religious as well as spiritual. I talked to him a lot and he always encouraged me to pray. And despite what people are doing, they're going to get their day of judgment soon. And he also encouraged me that just because people see you and treat you one way, that's not how God sees you. And you're going to be in this season, but the season is temporary. It's not permanent. Also, writing helped me cope. And it was writing in my in my journal, whether it was my hard copy journal or whether it was writing in the notes app on my phone, that just really allowed me to get those thoughts and emotions out of my head onto either paper or electronically, where it afforded me the ability to really self-reflect versus me exploding and giving them the satisfaction that they wanted. Because I truly felt like they were trying to push my buttons so they could label me as, oh, yep, I told you she was aggressive. Yep, that's another angry black woman or all the forms of microaggressions as well as aggressions that they like to use. But I wasn't going to stoop to their level. And Michelle Obama said it best. When they go low, we need to go high. Yeah. So I listened to a lot of sermons during the during the day to keep me grounded. I would play music while I was working. I would have Pandora going, whether it was CHH, Christian hip hop, whether it was R&B, whether it was, you know, just any type of music, I would really listen to the lyrics and try to zone out my outward surroundings and really just focus on my tasks. Then yeah. another, so there was different ways that I had my own coping mechanisms to help me get over the hump. And then I had a support system of, you know, like I said, my parents, my husband, and some close, and when I say close, less than five people that I felt like I could truly confide in and trust that were not associated with my place of work. Yeah, I've, I actually did similar things that when I worked for different agencies where I felt, uh, 
the opportunity for advancement wasn't there. I remember I used to put together, this was back when we had cassette tapes. I remember I had a, um, a, a box. It was like three or four feet long, you know, where we used to put the cassette tapes. And I used to listen to Les Brown on the way to work. It was a motivational speaker for those who don't know about him. Great motivational speaker. And I put together uh, cassette tapes of inspirational music and motivational music. And I didn't have the, you know, the father to talk to like you did. But I think it's absolutely great and imperative to do that. So what what eventually happened? And then how did you go um, and transition to writing your book? So um, after that whole incident happened and me just being bold and courageous, just speaking up, then a week later, I got a 20% pay increase, which was which was shocking, but it was long overdue. But what would have been sweeter would have been for them to go back and, you know, back pay me for the years that I was underpaid as a compliance coordinator. That would have really been the justice and the icing on the cake. But you know what? I was thankful for the 20% pay increase, especially during the pandemic. And the start of the pandemic last year because people were getting laid off. Then fast forwarding, my dad gets sick in May. Um, then my book comes out in May. But what allowed me to really write my book was the frustration that I was feeling at work. I wrote down in my note app, Chocolate Drop in Corporate America, and I wrote three sentences. But little did I know God was preparing me to write the book. But I had to meet another author who was already in the space of writing and authoring her book to really ignite me and help my baby leap. And when I say my baby, that's metaphorically speaking. When she talked to me, it was like the Mary and Elizabeth situation where the book inside of me leaped. And it was confirmation that, yes, you're on the right path. This needs to be birthed in and through you so you can help other people who have been slighted in the workforce, no matter what industry they're in, no matter what race they are, no matter what culture they come from. People in general need to hear what you went through, how you overcame it, and how you're now walking victorious, even despite the challenges that you face. Because even though I got laid off and they told me I was getting laid off December 1st, one week after my father passed away in November, on November 25th, 2020, one week later, December 1st, I found out that I was getting laid off. Then in February, this February, 2021, that was my last day on payroll. But I said, you know what? I'm thankful for the seven and a half years that I worked there because I met some great people. I learned some things that I didn't learn or know before. And then I had rapport with some of the people who I know, even though I'm not going to be with this company anymore, those are still some people I could call on in my time of need. So I try to take the negative and turn it into a positive. And I said, it has now propelled me to be more, more bolder, more courageous, and unapologetically unapologetically me where I could share my stories in hopes of inspiring, motivating, and educating other people who may still be in corporate America, but they're aspiring to do something different. Well, good for you. I think it's it's, it's a good, inspiring story. So where are things now? And then I want to talk about basically two other points. So now I have a second edition of my book out where I went back and included the information that happened in 2020 to me personally, as well as professionally. I started my own podcast called Gems with Genesis of Mars Kemp after receiving, you know, constructive criticism as well as feedback from other people saying you should have your own platform where you talk about stuff. And at first I didn't want to do it, but then it was a coping mechanism for me to just really de-stress and I have fun doing it. And the podcast is just me right now. I haven't interviewed anyone. Uh, So I have a goal where I want to put out X amount of episodes before I start bringing guests on my show. 
Then I've been featured in a few magazines. So doors have been just opening despite what has happened to me. And I know it's God, but I also know that my dad has his hand in it. And I grind the way I grind is because I'm doing it for future generations to come. I'm doing it to inspire my nieces and nephews. I'm doing it to inspire the next man or woman who was slighted in the workforce. And I'm doing it to show people Sometimes you need to be willing to be uncomfortable. Sometimes you have to be willing to take that leap of faith and do things despite the fear, despite false evidence appearing real. Sometimes you have to face everything and rise. Very, very true. And um, let me ask you, I have two more questions for you because there's so much that I wanted to interject while you were talking that you might have seen me off camera take out a piece of paper because there's all of these other things that I wanted to say or informational resources in between that I'm not going to interject and interrupt you. I wanted to let you really flow. So let me just ask you these two other questions and then we can talk a little bit further when we're done with the official in, uh, podcast interview because I just always have so much fun talking to you. You've been through a lot, you've overcome a lot, and you deserve the credit and respect for what you've gone through and for also what you've overcome. Um, but you're also a fun person to talk to. You have a very relaxed, uh, authentic demeanor. So every time I've talked to you before the podcast, I've always had so much fun. Um, so I wanted to just ask you two other questions. What type of, well, what business advice would you give to someone interested in leaving the corporate space? That's my first I would, one. I would definitely encourage um, the listeners, if you're interested in leaving the corporate space, get your game plan together. Find out what what is it that you want to do. What are you passionate about? Out of your passions, which one of those can you monetize? What can you see yourself doing without feeling burnt out, without feeling mentally, physically, and emotionally drained? Your next season that you're getting ready to walk in should be fruitful, and it shouldn't be a challenge to you. It should be something that comes naturally to you, maybe something that people always ask you to do and just gravitate to those things that you're good at and get a a um, piece of paper and a pen and write down all of, the, all of the things that you're passionate about and then really analyze out of those things, what is it that you could turn into a business and make sure whatever you decide to turn into a business, you stay true to your core mission statement and your values. Don't change who you are to appease other people and try to fit into the mold. Another thing, when you're getting ready to walk into business, make sure you have um, a lawyer on file, whether you use Legal Shield, whether you use maybe some um, pro bonos lawyers where they could just kind of guide you about contracts, master service agreements, and et cetera. If you're getting ready to do partnerships with people and you're not sure because you know, a pair of lips can say anything, but once something is in black and white, it stands. So just make sure you do your research whenever you're getting ready to build out your business as well as scale up because you want to make sure you have the proper protections in place. Another thing to do is take courses and never stop learning your industry or building your craft because knowledge is power. Wisdom is key. And you want to make sure you're always staying ahead of the game and ahead of the curve. And nothing beats a failure but a try. So always try and put your best foot forward. I couldn't agree more at all with any of that. So Genesis, I want to thank you so much for your time. Uh, where can people find your book, uh, Chocolate Drop in Corporate America from the Pit to the Palace? 
So my book, it's on the screen, Chocolate Drop in Corporate America from the Pit to the Palace is available for purchase on Amazon, Books a Million, Barnes and Noble, and some of the other um, major bookstores. If you also, if you want to get a autographed copy from me where I'll also personalize a message to you, you can email me at genesisamariskemp at gmail.com. And that's G-E-N-E. S I S A M A R I S K E M P at gmail.com and we could set something up. And if you want to find me on social media, I'm on Facebook as Genesis Amaris Camp, Instagram as Genesis Amaris Camp, and I do have an author page on Facebook under Genesis Amaris Camp dash chocolate drop in corporate America. Well, thank you again so much for your time. I really, really appreciate it. And please stick around for a few more minutes so we can continue the conversation, okay? Thank you. Okay. Thanks for tuning in to the David Summerfleck Podcast. If you would like to apply to be a guest on the podcast or would like to ask a question we may use in a future episode, please go to www.dms.blue slash podcast guest. Thanks again for tuning in and hope to meet you in the next episode.